Good afternoon. Welcome to the Noise Assessment Training Webinar produced by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Community Planning and Development, Office of Environment and Energy. Today's presenter is Jim Potter. We'd like to go over a few guidelines for participating in the webinar. The call will last approximately 90 minutes. All callers are muted due to the high number of participants. The webinar will be recorded for future use and made available for viewing and downloading. If you are having audio difficulties, you may want to use your telephone instead of your computer. If you have questions, you are welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the questions function on the GoToWebinar toolbar. Submit your questions by keying them in the text box under the questions pane on the toolbar. A resource advisor will forward some questions to the presenter to answer at the end of the webinar. And now I'd like to ha turn this over to Charlie Bean. Hi, and welcome to the webinar on HUD's noise policy and how to determine whether there is some noise pollution that needs to be abated. My name is Charlie Bean. I'm director of the Environmental Review Division here at HUD and acting director of the Office of Environment and Energy. Your presenter this afternoon will be James Potter. Mr. Potter is a planner who is on our staff and is the key departmental person on interpreting and establishing the, the environmental noise policies for the department. As, I, as was stated earlier, if you have questions, please enter them and they will be responded to as the program goes on. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, Charlie. Hello and welcome. I um, want to start with some basics about noise, why we care about it, uh, why it's you know, a concern to, to HUD and our constituencies, as well as some of the basics for noise assessments using HUD's protocols. Then we're going to, uh, throughout the presentation, I'm going to be using a case study to try and illustrate some of the points we're going to discuss. And then finally, we're going to take a look at um, what can be done in specific situations, and I'm hoping for a lot of questions on that to try and tailor this discussion to some of your project needs. I mean, we can't get too specific about things, so I'm going to try and, and restate your questions in broader terms that might be more applicable to a larger group of people. But still, the, the issues that you're um, finding on your particular projects are going to be similar to those of other grantees and, and developers. So they're of value to you, not only for the purposes of noise assessments and, and making sure that our protocols are going to apply to your particular circumstances, but also as a suggestion for improvements to the DNL calculator that we're going to be talking about, the barrier performance module that I'll show you briefly, and the other tools of the assessment tools for environmental compliance. Uh, those of you that joined us yesterday will, will saw some teasers of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to delve into more detail about just one of those tools, uh, the, the noise assessment portion. As you can see in this slide, there are a lot of reasons why we care about noise assessments and we do noise assessment training. That first noise, uh, the first one is, is the most obvious, of course, that it affects people's ability to use the property and get the most value out of the properties. Um, but that last one is, is probably as, as important as any. Um, we want to protect the investment, that, the public investment that HUD makes, and we want to make sure that your projects get the value, generate the wealth that you expect them to. So for those reasons, uh, we try to, to use noise as one of the ways to fulfill the goals of noise assessment and some of the uh, legislation that's created HUD in the first place. Uh, the first one here under our goals uh, comes from the Housing Act of 1949, creating and enforcing a standard for a decent home in a suitable living environment. That's really the basis for all of the environmental requirements that, that HUD has. 
you'll find that they may be a little bit different than you're used to. Uh, in, with the recent housing crisis and the changes in, in project financing, we're seeing a lot of folks come into the, into the HUD world, into the federal realm that have never dealt with the requirements for public financing before. They're a little different. They are not the same as public lenders often require, and there are some rules that you may not be familiar with. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this training in the first place. Decent and suitable living environment is important to us, and because of that, we care about some things that others don't, as I said. Uh, noise is just one of them. As far as the HUD Act of 1965, we want to determine feasible methods for reducing the economic loss. That's that, that last bullet that I talked about in the previous slide. And um, compatible land uses at federal airfields. You know, one of the first cases that brought noise to the attention of the department was at uh, Logan Airport in the 50s, where the noise from the newly introduced jets suddenly became a problem for residential communities surrounding the airport. And they never had to deal with it before because propeller airplanes typically didn't make enough noise to leave the property. But suddenly, the jet aircraft they were seeing after the first, after, I'm sorry, the Second World War, uh, caused a lot more noise and caused issues that they'd never had to deal with before. We started doing research as well as several other federal agencies, and that's where a lot of these requirements are coming from. Noise standards. This is the bread and butter. Outdoor standards. The acceptable range is less than or equal to 65 decibels. The normally unacceptable range from 65 through to and equal 75. And the unacceptable range is above 75 decibels. Decibels is, by the way, the, the standard metric for uh, measuring noise impacts. That's the outdoor. The indoor standard is 45 decibels. Uh, as you can see, I've shown the, the regulatory citations for both of those numbers. You can look them up. You need a little bit more detail on it or contact your field environmental staff. Uh, we've got 30 folks around the country that are very well versed in not only the noise requirements, but also all the other um, HUD requirements, environmental standards that uh, need to be enforced for our projects. At the bottom of that slide, I uh, tried to show you how that relates to environments that you may be familiar with already, so you can get a sense for what a decibel means, what uh, an acceptable noise range is. Uh, the average office, for example, if you look at the bottom under the relational examples, average office is around 55 decibels. Um, we all know what, you know what what offices sound like, so you can get a sense for what sort of normal. Um, uh, a nice walk through the woods might be you know, 20 decibels. At the top there, uh, the physiological milestones. I wanted to point out some of the other reasons, again, why we care about noise. Now, this whole idea of noise is based on the range of human hearing. That's got um, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, for those of you that keep in score. But the, the threshold of audibility is at the low end of this, obviously. At the high end is the threshold for pain. Uh, somewhere you know, working at the airport, very near a jet engine, it's going to hurt. That's why all those folks you see outside your aircraft and, and handling your luggage are all wearing ear protection. There is physical pain involved in dealing with extreme noise. Uh, none of our projects are going to be exposed to that level of, of, of noise, but it's something to keep in mind, um, something to remember that if they tell you that the noise is not an issue, well, it really could be. There, there are a whole range of effects. Pain is just one of them, but the threshold of feeling. And in fact, um, one of the, the main metrics for our noise standard was the interference with speech. So you'll see a lot of references to that or you know, dancing around it a little bit. But interference with speech is something that is important to our projects, not only for um, the value that they provide, but also for some of the reasons you can see here, that uh, there's a direct causal relationship between the outdoor noise and the interior noise. Uh, again, I've got a citation to the regulation that spells this out a little bit, but if the outdoor noise is 65 decibels or less, the indoor noise will be, or is considered to be, 45 decibels or less with typical construction. A uh, question that I often get about that one is, what is typical construction? We left that uh, vague. 
purposely because we it's assumed that each region of the country deals with their environmental conditions as appropriately as they need, as they should. Therefore, the the adobe in the southwest or the clappered frame in the northeast are going to deal with things the same. We're just going to uh, homogenize that for the entire country and say if it's typical for your area, it's going to provide an interior environment that you find suitable, and that's going to match up with the 45 decibel standard as far as the noise regulation is concerned. The um, outdoor recreation, um, things like you can't hear the coach, you can't hear instructions, you can't hear the lifeguard at the pool, and you're, you know, that could be a dangerous situation if you can't hear instructions that could stop you from making a mistake. Um, community cohesion is another one that we don't really talk about too much, but again, with speech interference, Things like in neighbors conversing across the back fence, block parties, uh, outdoor entertainment, all these things are, are uses of property that generate wealth that cause an, an enjoyment of that and enhance the value of the property and therefore noise interferes with them, so we're trying to control the noise and minimize that disruption. There are four major management options when dealing with noise. The first one is pretty obvious. You can reduce the noise that's emitted. The problem with that, of course, is we don't have any authority to do that. There's, uh, we can't call up, oh, Peter Bilt or Mack Truck and tell them to make their trucks quieter. Or the uh, Bombardier, whoever makes the trains in your community, and tell them the locomotives are too noisy. So that one has limited usefulness to us. There is a, a, a portion of the regulation that will allow for that, but Typically, we don't have the authority to go any further. Now, we do interact with other federal agencies that do. We make suggestions all the time. If you have suggestions, please pass them on to us, and we can pass them on to our contacts. The second bullet there is a little bit more useful. Separate the, separate the noise from the, uh, the observer. That means typically moving the building further from the sound. That sounds difficult, but if you've done the environmental compliance, at a point in the planning process where your site plan is not carved in stone, where nothing's really firm yet, you've addressed the site constraint issues, and noise would be one of them. So you've drawn a line on the, on the site plan that says this portion of the site is not acceptable from a noise standpoint, and this portion is. And therefore, the, the noise-sensitive uses or the residential building that is your project, that is the heart of your effort, can be placed in the area that's acceptable for it, and then things that are noise tolerant, parking lots, inf infrastructure like uh, pumping stations or power stations, um, a variety of other things like that that can tolerate higher noise can go in those areas where the housing can't. So that's a way that you can separate one you know, the, the problems from each other and still be able to use your site. Site planning, by the way, is the most cost effective least expensive way to deal with noise. Please consider the earlier that you consider environmental requirements in your planning process, the cheaper and easier it's going to be to comply, and the better project you're going to get. The third bullet, mitigate the property, is more difficult in a couple of different ways. Cost is the most obvious. You can build a wall between the highway that cuts across the back of your lot and the housing that you're building in the front of the lot but that's going to add hundreds of thousands of dollars to your project. And in an urban design sense, you may not want to wall off your community seemingly from the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, we don't want to point out that there's something different about this one. These communities should all blend into one another and become part of a larger neighborhood that's sustainable and growable and livable. So we don't always like noise barriers, but in some cases, you know, there's 27 lanes of highway in the back, you might want to think about that. You might want to think about partnering with your state Department of Transportation to use their Type 2 discretionary funding to build noise barriers to consider putting one against, you know, along the boundary of your property. They have discretion to use that funds. They have the ability to use that funds from the Federal Highway Administration. And they can do those kinds of things. If you've got a, you know, a compelling need and they've got a noise issue that, you know, that they are the generator of the noise. So they've got a stake in this as well. 
That fourth bullet, mitigate the building, is the least desirable of all of the options you see here. This basically writes off the outdoor uses and adds sound attenuation to the building itself. Where that uh, 45 decibel interior standard that we talked about earlier is very firm. We're very serious about that. We start getting into uh, sleep disturbance and other issues, um, children that can't do their homework at the dining room table because they can't think. Those kinds of things are something that need to be addressed. And uh, mitigating the building is obviously something that helps with that. But again, you've written off the outside. So think about not being able to use your yard in a single family house because it's just too noisy to do anything. You can't read a book. You can't play with your kids. It's, it's a problem. It is a legitimate mitigation strategy. Don't get me wrong. But it's not the most desirable of the four options that we have here. Noise in existing buildings. For modernization projects, HUD shall, this is directly from the regulation that's cited there, by the way, HUD shall encourage noise attenuation in all exposed areas. And for major substantial rehabilitation in normally unacceptable and unacceptable zones, HUD shall actively seek noise attenuation. And in unacceptable zones, we go a little bit stronger than that by saying strongly encourage. Those are vague terms, I'll grant you. And You'll need to work with your field environmental staff to find out exactly what that means for your project. In general, they should be commensurate with the effort. If your rehabilitation project is changing the faucets in the kitchen, we're not going to expect you to put in uh, a brick wall on the side of the highway to attenuate the noise from the cars. But within reason, within the scope of your project, if your rehabilitation effort, for example, is to replace the windows, Maybe this is the opportunity to put in a better grade of window so that you can actually attenuate the noise and reach that interior goal of 45 decibels that we really want. It'll make a better project. It'll make happier residents. It'll make more value in your project and get more out of the, the investment that you've made. The major noise concerns, uh, for the most part, they're transportation sources. They're the most common in the urban environment. There are a couple of things that we'd like to, to work with but don't have any regulatory authority to do that with yet. But airports, railways, and railroads are the major noise sources in the urban environments where HUD-assisted projects exist. The fourth one there, military and industrial facilities, deals with loud impulse sounds. That's something we're going to talk about in a little bit. It's a little bit different, but uh, really not that difficult to handle scary, isn't it? The assessment process of how and what to do. I tried to break down the different the portions of the process into easily definable steps. And later on, you're going to see how these steps are related to the data requirements. Uh, you can infer some of that from the boxes below the, the process chart above. But these are the kinds of information, these are the kinds of data that we need to input at these different stages to do a HUD noise assessment. Uh, from a macro level, if you look at step two, gathering data and count, da gathering data for raw, uh, gather raw data for calculations. Thank you very much. Uh, is the most intensive. That's where all of the uh, information gets generated. Uh, behind the scenes, that's where all the phone calls and emails are. That's where all the letters are. If you're dealing with railroads and the railroad operators, they're going to want letters on letterhead to know that you're an official source acting in an official capacity because they have very serious security concerns. That all takes time. It's time that we don't necessarily count within the actual calculation because it's so hard to quantify. We don't know how responsive they're going to be to any individual. Uh, you can help that by creating relationships with the data sources. Talk to your local DOT. Talk to the jurisdictions where you're doing housing projects. Talk to the Public Works Department and the people that have traffic volume data. Talk to the railroad operators that travel through your jurisdiction. Get to know them. Get them to understand your needs. And then when you call them up on a project, they'll be a little more understanding of what you're trying to, um, trying to get. They'll already know what your needs are, what your goals are, and they'll probably be more likely to help you. Uh, that's a long-term strategy. But uh, step two is definitely where you're going to put most of your effort. 
the first step, of course, is understanding the project. So you need to know what's proposed, where it's located, who will be affected, and what is in the vicinity. Again, our noise sources are transportation, so uh, what's in the vicinity is important. The threshold requirements for noise assessments are major roads within 1,000 feet of your project, railroads within 3,000 feet of your project, and airports within 15 miles of your project. And they may not generate noise out that far, but you need to know where they are and what they're doing and at least do some research on them so that you can discount them and justify that with some data, with some reasons why you didn't count that international airport that everybody knows about. As I said, we're going to illustrate some of these issues with a case study. Uh, the New Vision Center was a project that was in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa a while back. Um, some of these, it was a fairly typical kind of project. There are some things about it that are unique, but I think we can use it as a good illustration for what kinds of things can happen, do happen, how we dealt with different challenges that came up. Uh, it won't apply to everyone's project, but it's a good illustration of, of today's discussion. So the program. This particular project was a homeless shelter for adults. Counseling and dining facilities were to be included. An important point about this building program was there were no outdoor uses. Folks came in late in the evening. They got some dinner. They went to sleep. They left early in the morning virtually nothing going on outside. And at the same time, the counseling and dining facilities uh, were interior uses. I mean, the, the sleeping areas were certainly noise sensitive interior you know, residential uses. But the layout of the building itself had not been finalized. So we not only had the opportunity to site the building, but we had the opportunity to relocate interior spaces. Remember the on uh, not remember. I didn't tell you that. Uh, you know, we talked about outdoor uses being noise tolerant and noise sensitive. There are also interior spaces that are noise tolerant and noise sensitive. There's a very good discussion of this in the noise guidebook. It's the department's major guidance on noise assessments and noise in general. You can take a look at that. Uh, it's online. It's available from your field environmental staff. It'll spell out how you can work with different uses to create a project that can work with the challenges that you found on your site. The noise sources in the vicinity of this one, uh, the, the real challenge was a major rail yard that was immediately behind the property. One of the rail lines was literally 40 feet from the back property line. There were two civilian airports within 15 miles, and there was a local arterial road 400 feet from the site. So gathering data. I told you this is the most intensive part of the whole process. One of the things that you need to start with, and it's part of that understanding the project, is talk to the developer, the sponsor of the program. Get them to understand why noise is an issue. Uh, in the case of Council Bluffs, the developer was very well aware that not only the funding requirement, but also for the value of this project, for the success of this project, the noise from that rail yard was going to have to be managed somehow. You need to find out things like, are there future phases, are there uses that can be shifted around, how firm is the building plan, uh, all these kinds of questions the developer can help you with off the top of their head, and you have an opportunity to partner with them to make a better project. Will there be outdoor uses? That's important. Some of the uh, HUD's constituents are very keen on that. Others, you know, it could be the, the difference between a successful project and a failure. Uh, it hasn't come up for quite a while, but I'll tell you that at the beginning of the the beginning of the noise regulation, there was a lot of discussion about how to handle outdoor concert halls and amphitheaters and things like that where performance art would be affected by high noise. Site planning, we already talked about the importance of that. Is it complete? You know, can it be influenced? In the particular case of Council Bluffs, they had a preliminary plan, but it wasn't finalized, so we were able to make some, some shifts. And finally, are there proposed uses that are less sensitive? We've already discussed that. In the case of Council Bluffs, they had the dining facilities. They had offices. Counseling is kind of um, on the borderline, but the residential uses within were certainly noise sensitive, and they needed to be protected. 
site and vicinity maps are very important, not only in understanding the, the particular property and its challenges, but also the effect of surrounding uses. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. Planometrics show just the physical features on the ground, buildings and tree lines, and a few other things that I've shown here on the slide. Topographic maps add another layer of detail in that they show con uh, contours of, of elevation. Uh, maybe previewing things a little bit here, but you can use the natural topography to shield a project from noise. I had a question just this morning about a, a project in uh, Washington State where they've got a railroad that's a couple of hundred feet from a, a proposed project, but the railroad is depressed um, roughly 10 to 15 feet below the grade, below the, uh, the ground level of the housing project. So we're trying to determine how much barrier um, mitigation can be credited for that difference in elevation. Those are the kind of things you need to understand because you can take advantage of those for your project as well. A natural feature like a depressed roadway or a railway doesn't cost you a thing, but it does reduce the noise from that facility and make your noise exposure across the street 100 feet away, 1,000 feet away lower. Is it site if possible? Uh, I know that's difficult with our schedules and budgets, but you can do that virtually now through satellite imagery. Don't, uh, don't think that your computer on your desk is just for drafting the letters and reports. You can do a lot remotely now that wasn't available just a few years ago. And as an example of that, this is a satellite image of the particular site that we're talking about. The new vision center is shown in the center with a yellow push pin. And some of the major noise generators are shown around it. Local arterial street, off at Air Force Base, just outside our threshold at 16 miles. We didn't have to worry about that as part of the noise assessment, fortunately, because they have a lot of jets fighter jets, and they have a transportation mission as well, so they have very large cargo jets. Uh, but it was outside our threshold, so we didn't have to worry about it. The two municipal airports, the Council Bluffs Airport and Epley Airfield, were much closer, but because of the type of aircraft that they serviced, we didn't have to worry about them too much either. They really didn't generate enough noise to affect this site. Again, the major challenge was that existing rail yard just in back of the property. We're still in step two. Review local plans for proposed features. Uh, I'm a planner, so I'm going to tell you to always talk to the planners because they know everything. And one of the ways that you can determine that is by looking at the documents that they've generated. Now, they come by a, diff a variety of different names. They could be comprehensive plans, economic development plans, transportation has state transportation improvement plans, and uh, capital improvement plans at the municipal level. They could just simply be development plans, land use plans, or a land use component of another larger document. Infrastructure planning can show you roads as well as sewers. Zoning can show you what's proposed for the future. Even if they don't necessarily have a development program in mind, they have a plan for where things are going to go if a proposal does come their way. So talk to the local, develop, local planners about what's coming five years and ten years from now. That's important because the regulation encourages you to use data 10 years in the future. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Airports. Airports generate a lot of noise. And the good news is most installations that generate noise have a plan for how to deal with it. They also have staff that's familiar with the requirements of noise. The Federal Aviation Administration, as part of their environmental requirements, requires that airports plan, create noise plans, and publish those noise plans. Military installations have documents called air installation uh, com compatible use zones, ACUS maps, that show their operations and the noise generated by their operations and how that affects not only the installation itself, but also the communities outside the fence. They as a part of the Department of Defense instruction that created ACUS, have a requirement to share that information. Now, the first couple of phone calls at the installation or the, the airport may not generate a successful response. They may not know that they're supposed to share that. And it feels like 
sensitive information that they shouldn't share. But keep calling. Keep asking for somebody's boss. Eventually, you'll find the person that realizes that that's information that they need to share and they need to work with you on to get compatible land uses that work with both your needs and theirs. Anybody that doesn't think that's important should check into the base realignment and closure activity every five years, see what affects the closing of bases and the uh, encroachment of land uses has on those bases. So it's important, and they know it, so they'll work with you. Roadways. We want to talk a little bit about this. State Departments of Transportation have got information. Depending on the road's classification, and often it's uh, um, maintenance needs, um, a lot of um, departments have got, you need to talk to different people about different information. So it may not be the state, it might be the city or county that has the information, but again, look for 10-year traffic projections. That's important. Ask for a percentage breakdown of automobiles. That's important. Ask for the percentage of nighttime use. We've got some assumptions built into the worksheets, but it's important that uh, you ask the questions to get better information. We're looking for the best available data. Our projections coordinated with the local plans. That uh, refers to development that may be happening that some people don't know about. Maybe the, uh, the local Department of Transportation doesn't know that the building department just approved a project for a new shopping center or a new subdivision that's going to bring 2,000 more families to the area and however many trips that generates on the local roadways and the effect it has on the noise signature. Railroads. Check with the Federal Railway Administration's crossing inventory database. That's probably your first step. Uh, FRA has got a really good website. The problem with the, the crossing inventory database is that it's updated um, voluntarily by the railroad operators. So it's not the most up-to-date, it's not the most complete information, but it's a good start. It'll tell you what railroads are using the tracks in the area, and then, then will allow you to contact the railroad operators to get better information. Um, things that you need to know that are in the database, though, are, are there whistle stops near the site? Are there at-grade road crossings that the whistle stops would require? I've got an uh, illustration later on about what the, what the uh, whistle stops are and how they affect your site, but it's important to ask that question. How many trains per day? Critical. Uh, at the Council Bluff site, the, the case study that we're using, there were 38 trips per day. That was a lot. That particular track that was adjacent to the property didn't have quite that many. But you can vary the effects of the noise by the effective distance from the property. So once you've found the track and found the activity on that track, you're only assessing the noise from that activity, from that track. So keep that in mind as you go through the assessment. Other things you need to know are how many cars are in the train, whether the locomotives are diesel or electric, uh, and how many locomotives there are per train. Uh, some parts of the country, mountainous areas, are going to have multiple locomotives. Uh, Amtrak or commuter trains typically only have one. But you need to know that because every one of them generates noise. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out from this is I mentioned uh, security concerns by rail operators. This is probably a good point in the presentation to talk about that briefly. Keep in mind that to do a HUD noise assessment, you do not need to know what is in the cars. Let me repeat that. You do not need to know what is in the rail cars on that track. You need to know how many cars there are. You need to know how many locomotives there are. You need to know what kind of, what the propulsion of those locomotives, you know, whether it's diesel or electric. The security concern of the rail operators is from uh, an outgrowth of 9-11. They're concerned about terrorist activity. So they're worried about things that could go boom. And you don't need to know whether it's a highly flammable liquid or whether it's a box car full of popcorn. They're both going to generate the same noise, and 
both of those cars do exactly the same thing for your purposes. You can explain that to the rail operator. You can help put them at ease and help them help you. So keep that in mind. Security is real for them, but the information that you need doesn't affect their security. This is the discussion about whi uh, whistle stops that I wanted to talk to you about. As you can see by that yellow box with the, the dashed line around it, that is the area affected by whistles, horns, if you will. The, the whistles are from the steam age, and now we use um, air pressure and horns. But the same idea. They, they need a warning device that they can blow in advance of a conflict. In most cases, that's a grade crossing that's a, a road and a railroad at the same elevation using the same point so that cars are crossing the tracks and trains are crossing the road. At that conflict point is where the accidents happen. So a quarter mile before the crossing, the train's going to blow its horn. That's in each direction. So a quarter mile in this example here to the right, a quarter mile to the left, they're going to blow their horn. And you need to know about that 3,000 miles from the center of the track. Now, as you can see from that proposed housing site A, the green box on the left-hand side, only a portion of the site is covered by that area with the, that are exposed to the whistles. That means that the portion that's not within the yellow box is not affected by the horns. If the horns are the problem, if the horns are what's throwing that railroad noise over the acceptable level, maybe you can relocate your housing to the portion that's not affected by the horns. Again, site planning is the cheapest and easiest way to comply the noise regulation. Move the housing to where the horns don't apply, and then, then you're just dealing with the rail noise. Move it to the as far away from the tracks as possible, and you'll reduce the, the effect of the train noise on your site. You'll get a better site. But uh, housing site B, the green box on the right-hand side, is not affected by whistle stops. There is no at-grade crossing. Therefore, the adjustment factor in the calculation for the horns doesn't apply to that. Maybe that site's better for the housing than site A. Those are all decisions that you need to make, and they're really easy to do at the project planning level. By the way, if you're out at the site, that sign with a W is the whistle stop sign. So something like that or some variant is what tells the engineer to blow the whistle. It's really that simple. Look for that when you're on the site or go to the crossing database that will have the information for you. Talking to the rail operator is the best. Yes, we're still in step two. Military installations and industrial facilities. I was talking to you earlier about loud impulsive sounds and I will get into that, I promise. But you need to find out who's in the neighborhood and identifying the military installations is important. Uh, the 15 miles that I've listed there is for air installations. So off at Air Force Base at, at Council Bluffs was the issue. Again, it was too far away. It was 16 miles according to Google Earth or, or a MapQuest or whoever I checked that time. But uh, it was something that needed to be investigated. And if somebody asked the question, you need to have a good answer for why you didn't add that factor in. So keep that in mind. Cover your butt. Uh, the cross-service locators that I've shown there will help you identify different military installations, globalsecurity.org and uh, globemaster.de bases. Um, some of them are more useful than others. There are others out there, but those are two websites where you can find information about installations. Now, they'll not only tell you uh, where they are, but they'll also tell you something about the installation's mission, the tenant units, the major activities, those are all potential noise sources. If you see things in the tenant list, like explosive ordnance disposal, you might think that they blow things up. That could be the loud, impulsive sounds that you need to know about. So ask the questions. Go through the due diligence to find out what's in the area. Get the good answer for the person that's going to ask the question. Factories, warehouses, distribution centers, these are all things where trucks uh, congregate where noise sources can be found. They also operate at odd hours of the day. Uh, at Council Bluffs, for example, there was one train that arrived 
every other day at 3 a.m. That's something you need to know about because the day-night noise level that is the metric that HUD uses for noise assessments has a penalty for nighttime noise. A couple of reasons for that, mostly for sleep disturbance. But anything that happens at night is penalized an additional 10 decibels above whatever noise it actually generates. And the basic reason for that is because it, people are more sensitive to the, the difference in noise, the, the differential between the ambient noise and this sudden intrusion of a train at 3 a.m., for example, is much more pronounced when there's nothing else going on than it is at noon when everybody's out having lunch and cars are driving around, et cetera, et cetera. So nighttime noises are important. Hours of operation for noise generators give you that information and give you some insights into what's happening in the neighborhood. Summary time. What do you say? Talk to the developer, project sponsor. Understand the project. Contact the noise sources. You've got a lot of people to talk to. They've all got information that you can use. Airport managers and noise offices, state and local departments of transportation. Don't forget metropolitan planning organizations. They are the regional bodies that do transportation planning and are established by the U.S. Department of Transportation for transportation planning. They're the ones that have the information about what's happening 20 years out. Railroad operators have got the best available information about what happens on those rail lines. Most rail operators, as an aside here, uh, most rail operators don't own the tracks that they use. They lease them from owners, from people that own the tracks, or maybe a subsidiary part of the corporation that runs the trains. So that means, in, for you, in noise assessment terms, that the operators know exactly how many trains went over a given piece of track every time it happens because they're charged for that by the person that, or the entity that owns the tracks. The information's out there. Convince them that you have a legitimate need to get it and get them to give it to you. If they still stonewall you, contact your field environmental staff or HUD headquarters, and sometimes the 2 2 area code is enough to convince them that they've uh, perhaps been a little too conservative in their estimates. Uh, as the last bullet there, uh, I'm going to emphasize, talk to local planners. You need to know things 10 years in the future. They're one of the few entities and people that actually know what's going to happen 10 years in the future, or at least have a good guess for you. Best available information is what we need. Do the due diligence to find the best available information, and your noise assessment is going to be acceptable to us. I promised you a discussion about loud, impulsive sounds. Um, you may want to tune out right now because this gets a little bit technical, but I've tried to boil it down to the essentials. They have an enormous effect. If you look at that bottom, that bottom bullet, if you find loud, impulsive sounds that affect your sight, you must add 8 decibels to the total found from the other noise sources, right off the top. And as you remember back from the standards and the ranges that we have for acceptable, normally unacceptable, and unacceptable, they're 5 to 10 decibels different. So adding 8 decibels to whatever you found through that other stuff is going to make a huge impact on what the noise exposure is on your site. Military installations are one of the sources of loud impulsive sounds, probably the major source. We've also had projects in the vicinity of rock quarries to do an explosion to remove overburden as a, as a part of their daily operation. Those kinds of activities are what we're concerned about. In the middle of this slide is the definition from the regulation that determines what exactly a loud impulse sound is. Uh, again, as I said earlier, this is very technical. Uh, you're probably going to, if you have a question about this, you're going to have to talk to resources to find a, a consultant that can do a noise study to affirm that. In reality, it's pretty obvious. If the, the tenant organization at the military base across the road does explosive ordnance testing, if they do um, artillery training, 
if they have tanks that do training on a range somewhere nearby, if the actual range where you are is, um, oh, I don't know, it's the bombing range for uh, an airfield that might be 30 miles away. But the range is, you know, where they actually drop the bombs is next to your site. Well, that's the kind of information that you need to know in order to factor that in. If it exists, add the eight decimals. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't. It's very binary. I told you we've got several different noise sources. Most urban sites are affected by more than one noise source. Uh, that uh, question that I got from Washington State today had a railroad in, across the street in front, had an interstate highway across the back, had a major road in between, a, a local arterial along the railroad that crossed the site on the, on the south side. So you need to assess the noise from each of those sources, and then you need to combine them for the site exposure. Um, that is not done by A plus B equals C. It's the noise calculations are all logarithmic for those that are that still have a slide rule somewhere deep in the back of their desk. And because of that, there's a, a relationship between the difference in the sound levels and the actual factor that you add to the largest. There's a table in the noise guidebook. It's represented here in the table on this slide. Uh, basically, as the, the difference in the sound level goes up, the factor that you add goes down. When you get to something greater than 16 decibels difference, if the highway is 16 decibels louder than the railroad in, in the Washington State example, then you don't add anything to the highway noise because that has overshadowed everything else that's going on. That's the real dominant noise source. But if it's somewhere in between, if it's only four decibels different, well, then you would take the highway noise, you look it up in the chart here, and you would add 1.5 decibels to the highway noise, and that would then be the exposure from both the railroad and the highway at that particular point on the site that you're assessing. That point is referred to in the guidebook as the noise assessment location. You can have multiple noise assessment locations. That's part of the site planning that you can do. That's part of what we talked about in the whistle stop illustration of moving the site to something that's less noise exposed, moving the project rather to something that's less noise exposed. You can have a noise assessment location that's within the area that's affected by horns and one that's outside to see what the difference is. You can have one that's yeah, at the extreme edge away from the highway so that you're mostly affected by the railroad or vice versa. If you've got a problem, try that. Try doing multiple noise assessment locations and see if there is an effect that you can take advantage of, if you've sufficiently buffered yourself from the noise source so that you can have a successful project and still minimize your cost. Um, I'm straying a little bit away from this particular slide, but you, you need to know that sounds, there you're going to have multiple sources affecting a particular site. They're not just added one for one. Um, frankly, if you had 265 you know, acceptable noises, that does not make 130 decibels because that would be you know, unrealistic, unfair, and, un, and unreasonable. So um, if there's zero difference, as you can see here in the chart, then you're only going to add three decibels to the loudest or whichever one you choose, and the example being equal. Um, 68, not too bad. You can work with that. Now, the DNL calculator is a tool that we've developed uh, maybe three years ago now to automate the manual process that's in the noise guidebook. Uh, those of you, how many of you were on the webinar yesterday and, and got an, a viewing of the assessment tools for environmental compliance? Yeah, just raise, yeah, raise your pads up and wave them over your head. Yeah, I, I can't see the folks on the West Coast. Could you stand up and just wave them over your head? Great, we got a, quite a few participants. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to go through very briefly what ATEC is, again, for those that weren't involved. This is a standalone presentation. You don't need to have been through yesterday's. Although, if you're curious, yesterday's presentation will be archived and available and accessible through the ATEC website. So if you're curious and, and missed it yesterday, feel free to access it at your convenience. Um, probably a good time to note that the Office of Environment and Energy is doing a couple of other webinars on other aspects of um, the assessment tools for environmental compliance, ATEC, and you might want to check into the schedule for those as well. Um, in fact, the next one is Monday on acceptable separation distances done by Nelson Rivera, the, the mastermind behind the calculations of all these calculators. Anyway, uh, ATEC has got a variety of different tools. Tribal Database is one of the webinars that we're going to be doing in November. Uh, Nancy Boone is going to be providing that. And that's going to be important, by the way, because an update of the current tool is going to be presented then. So you really should try and make that available in your schedule. There will be an announcement coming out soon. Um, but try and check out the update, the, uh, the current model, the current tool that's available on ATEC is a little outdated, a little static, and we're trying to, we're going to be making major improvements to that, so stay tuned, something's coming in the very near future. Uh, Section 106 Programmatic Agreement Database is a, a compilation of examples of successful PAs that you may use as a template for something you want to do that's very similar. Take a look at what's already been approved and, and agreed to and uh, might save you some time. The ASD calculator I talked about, a typical separation distance, is something that keeps people safe in a nutshell. It's the tool that calculates the distance that a project needs to be from a flammable or explosive facility. Uh, the picture you should have in your mind right now is the the 30,000 gallon propane tank that's next to the multifamily housing. That's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. The DNL calculator we're going to talk about, Barrier Performance Module, is another one that you're going to get very familiar with because when the DNL calculator tells you that the noise is unacceptable, you're going to want to look for alternatives. And uh, Barrier Performance Module is something that's going to help you. Straight Cat is the latest addition to ATEC. And that deals with that uh, fourth bullet in the mitigation options of calculating the performance of the building envelope as regards to noise. So the, the number and type and area of windows and doors, the type and materials of the wall section that's exposed to the noise, all gets input into the Stray Cat, the Sound Transmission Classification Assessment Tool, and it generates the interior noise, and then it tells you whether it's acceptable or not. So really cool. I encourage you to check, a look, check it out, take a look at it, play with it, see if you like it. If you don't, tell us why. But the DNL calculator is what we're going to talk about most right now. Um, the website there is where you can find it. I'll try and show you live uh, what I like is a better way to get to it through HUD.gov. It's a little simpler, and you don't have to copy and paste all that stuff or even try and remember it. So uh, I'll show you that in just a minute when we get done here. It has guidelines in the DNL calculator for how to begin the process, tool tips for what numbers go into what input boxes, as well as the user's guide to help you walk through how to use the tool itself and get the output that you need, and a realistic, uh, usable output that you need. In the beginning, you just provide basic site information. You add noise sources as necessary. You can see at the bottom of this uh, screen capture, there's an add road source, add rail source, and calculate the site DNL. Uh, one little trick I do want to point out to you is that you should always start with a road source. That's not normally a problem, but uh, there have been instances where people said, well, you know, there's just a local road out front. It doesn't get that much traffic in the, within the within the 1,000 feet of my site. You know, it's a, it's a residential neighborhood that doesn't get a lot of traffic, so there is no major road. And that's fine. You understand your local conditions better than I do. I'm just saying, you know, for the purposes of using the calculator, add a road, skip over that, and then add the rail source or whatever the source is beyond that. Calculator will work more reliably for you in that regard. This is what you see when you add a road source. The trick here is in the vehicle type line 
Uh, let me see if I can point that out with a mouse here. There. Hopefully you can see that mouse moving along the vehicle type. It says cars, medium trucks, and heavy trucks across the top line of the, uh, of the input box. You need to check those boxes in order to make the input boxes in the column below that vehicle type active. That's the only trick. Check the box. If you have cars on that road, check the box that says cars, and then add your input data below. Medium trucks, same thing. Heavy trucks. If you don't have any heavy trucks, then uh, don't check that box, and that column will not be available to you. Railroads work the same way. So if you have electric locomotives on a particular track, and you can see the track identifier at the top, you can add as many tracks as you need to. Um, select the locomotive type, electric or diesel, and then the effective distance, the train speed, all those other input boxes will be available to you. When you get done, push the calculate button. It'll show you what the site DNL is. Complete all the data inputs. Calculate the site DNL, which is right at the bottom there. That tells you the, the rail for the noise from that railroad for the input data that you've uh, given it in that box there. The site DNL will add whatever other rail sources there are, whatever road sources there are, whatever you've input in this session will be combined and reported in that box when you hit the Calculate Site DNL button. So to remind you where we are, this is the process chart again of how and what. We've now figured out that what the noise is, and as you can see on the far right at the bottom there, there's barrier design information. If you found that, yeah, if you found that the um, barrier design or the, the noise was unacceptable, you've got some options and we'll talk about those in a minute, but these are the, the data inputs if you need to think about barriers. These are the data inputs you need and this is the point in the process where you need to start thinking about barriers. Once you know that you've got a noise problem, you need to figure out a way to deal with it. Barriers are one option, site planning is a better one. Now, in the Council, Council Bluffs example that we've been talking about, um, they had aircraft noise, as we talked about. It came in at about 58 decibels. They had roadway noise. There was a local arterial that I didn't mention, but it was in the, in the front street, uh, 46 decibels for that, not a lot of traffic. The railway that we're really concerned about was 62 decibels. The uh, most active tracks ended up being on a through track that was the farthest away from the site. So the most noise was generated by the things furthest away and that several hundred feet of buffer was enough to reduce that to an acceptable level. The track that was only 40 feet from the back property line ended up being a track that was only used to store a, a yard mule, uh, just a, a locomotive that they use for assembling trains. It, it moved by itself at a very slow speed they used that track to put it on a siding. Uh, they kept it there overnight, and they brought it back out in the day to, to uh, assemble more trains. So there really wasn't a whole lot of noise from the closest track. Site DNL came out at 64 decibels in the acceptable range. At this point, uh, you need to look at that yellow note at the bottom. These are not precise calculation. Noise is affected by a lot of different things, weather conditions, temperature, wind direction, a lot of things that are unquantifiable, uncalculable. We're trying to look at, at neutral average conditions here. For that reason, we accept a one decibel tolerance on findings. So if this had come out at you know, 65.9, we would have found that acceptable. We're not going to hold anybody's feet to the fire for decibel differences. But you need to prove to us that you know, if it's marginal, we're going to scrutinize it a little bit more just to make sure that it's not that it's done properly. Let's put it that way. So what if it wasn't acceptable? We talked about this briefly in a couple of examples. Uh, the first option that I want you to think about is pick another site. Not all sites are appropriate for housing. But if this one is otherwise appropriate for housing, there are some things you can do. Uh, consider exterior mitigation. Revise the site design. That's your number one best alternative. Uh, constructing a barrier is sometimes also an option, and, and it can be very effective. 
again, you might be able to get other agencies to help with the construction and funding of those kinds of facilities. So don't rule it out, but uh, remember the urban design components of walling off your property from the rest of the neighborhood. Remember there's things like um, um, crime prevention through environmental design where you want natural surveillance and eyes on the street. Walls are very incompatible with that. Um, and then the finally, uh, you can consider interior mitigation. If there's no outdoor noise sensitive uses, you can use the wall sections to find the, the appropriate uh, mixture of materials and windows to create the interior environment that we need. That 45 decibel interior standard is firm and it's easy to attain. To close this out, uh, I wanted to remind you again, we've got a lot of staff in the field, and in every region there are qualified professionals that know how to work through these, uh, these questions that can help you with site planning and, and attenuation mitigation issues. The regional environmental officers and field environmental officers are very accustomed to these kinds of challenges and they can help you get a quality project. Now I wanted to just briefly show you, I, I promised to show you an easy way to get to the assessment tools for environmental compliance and by extension the DNL calculator. This page is www.hud.gov. Don't believe that stuff you see at the top left. This is HUD's homepage. From the homepage, Go to topical areas. Within topical areas, you'll find environment. Click on environment. This is the Office of Environment and Energy's homepage. At the bottom of that, you'll see that uh, flower-shaped logo for the assessment tools for environmental compliance. You can click on the logo. You can click on the hot link next to it. But please click on it because there's a lot of things in there that are going to help you. Once you're at the ATEC website, you'll see an index for a variety of different tools that we've collected to help your environmental compliance efforts. And uh, by the way, your site planning efforts, we are, one of our goals is to make environmental compliance so easy that you're going to use this in one of scenarios to get better projects rather than just paperwork um, generating requirements for compliance. Bottom right, you'll see noise abatement and control. And the second bullet there is the day-night noise level calculator. I think that's the easiest way to get to it. Once you're there, there's a little bit of guidance at the top about how it's applied and what it means. And at the bottom is to use the DNL calculator, click on the following link. That takes you to the calculator itself. Um, some other things that you'll see along the way, I'm not going to go into this unless we have specific questions, but the uh, other things that are available through ATEC are the noise guidebook, the noise abatement control site, you can see um, the requirements for compliance, laws and regulations that apply, environmental subjects. You can get the stray cat from here, sound transmission classification assessment tool. You can get to the DNL calculator from here. In addition, there are noise fact sheets and the noise guidebook. Training modules, the basic uh, Pretty much the same training module that you've just gone through is available through this site. And there is another one, I believe the part two training module that's listed here goes into barrier performance. So there are a lot of different uh, tools at your disposal. They're all available through the, in the Office of Aurora Energy's Assessment Tools for Environmental Compliance website. And now in the remaining minutes, I'm going to go through some of these questions that, uh, that you've sent in. By the way, thank you for that. And don't stop. All right, if we run out of time here, we're going to generate the answers to these questions or you know, combine like questions into a single response. But we're going to get answers to as many of these as we possibly can and post them. Uh, post them or we'll respond to you directly depending on the, the content of the question. So let's get to a couple of them right now question, what about longer duration sound emissions? For example, compressors that cycle on and off as necessary truck terminals. 
Good question. We don't have a regulatory, uh, statutory authority to handle what are known as stationary noise sources. Um, you could also add air conditioner compressors to that list of urban, typical urban noise generators that are not transportation oriented. We don't have a, like I said, we don't have a regulatory requirement for that, but I do get a lot of questions about how to handle that and what to do about it. The, my best advice is to talk to the, uh, if it's a neighboring land use or you know, uh, the property owner next door that has this use, try to talk to them about shielding that use from you, from your project. If it's the equipment on your site that you're concerned about, be considerate of your neighbors. Maybe you can relocate that stuff to the roof where it's not going to be affected, not going to affect the street level noise or or other outdoor uses. Maybe you can put it inside the building so that it's shielded from the outdoor. There are a lot of ways to handle it, but unfortunately, I don't have one that's uh, that that can be easily enforced by the department. Question. Is the distance measured from the military base, or is it the distance from the airfield? Um, good question. Noise happens in a variety of different places, and military installations tend to be very large. So do yourself a favor. Do a little more investigation. Find out where they do that artillery training, where they do those explosive ordnance disposal activities, and refine your search a little bit so that you can get as much distance as you can. I mean, after all, if, uh, oh, let's say the, the local installation does um, special operations training and they only fire small arms and, and small explosives at the, on the shoreline, well, if that's, you know, a mile away from your project, even though you're across the street from the main gate, use the mile. Do yourself a favor. The explosives are, only, are not going to affect your site at that kind of distance. And that can help make that. It's, it's not going to degrade from the project. It's not uh, being evasive at all. It's truth. That's where it happens. So I would use the distance from the noise source. And if you've got a question, um, ask the people that know. They'll help you. Question. When measuring separation distance from an airport, where do you start measuring? Uh, again, you know, this isn't the kind of, let's rephrase this. The best thing to do at airports is to find the noise map of the noise contours and then locate your site on their map and read directly off of their map what the noise exposure is. You can interpolate between contours what the actual uh, noise exposure is. That's also very helpful for the kinds of things we just talked about to, to get as close to the nearest decibel as you can. I hope that helps. But the best thing to do with airports is to, to find out from them where the noise is generated. They've got the information and they should be willing to share it with you. Convince them to do so. Question. Railway operators have referred me to the Federal Railway Administration's website, Crossing Data. Is this adequate source, even if the FRA disclaims the accuracy? I think we talked about this a little bit, but yeah, it is an adequate source. It's a good starting point. It'll tell you what rail operators use that particular line. The problem with it is it's updated voluntarily, and therefore it is a bit out of date. But you can find out who the rail operators are, talk to the rail operators about who they share the tracks with, um, and they'll, that'll be the best source of information. Next question, are we allowed to accept data compiled by the owner, developer, and or lender in order to perform a noise study? Yes, you are actually encouraged to get noise data from whatever sources are available. Uh, the only caveat I put on that is you're signing the noise assessment. Make sure that the data that you get is reasonable and accurate. Uh, never hurts to, to call the local planner or or a public works office to check on the traffic volumes that you were told by someone else. Uh, another telltale sign for me is when something comes in at 64.9 decibels and they tell me it's acceptable and I 
always look closely at that data. I'd advise you to do the same. Next question. With increased security concerns among various railroads, it is getting harder and harder to obtain the required data in order to perform a railroad noise study. Uh, we talked about that a little bit, and I agree with you. It's difficult. Uh, in some cases, there are rail yards that have national importance, national significance. And as such, they're even more difficult to get data out of than the, than the freight line that's connecting you know, the, the little burg and the manufacturing facility on the edge of town. Uh, they all have concerns. They all need to understand what your goals are. Again, you don't need to know what's in the cars. All you need to know is how many cars there are, how often they come through, the operational data, operational information about what happens on that track. You don't need to know what's in the cars. That will go a long way toward helping them uh, assuage their concerns and work with you. Also, long-term relationships with these folks will help you understand, help them understand your needs, will help them understand that you're a legitimate consumer of data and that you're doing good things for this community that they are a part of. So uh, work with them. Work with them. They'll work with you. In the worst case scenario, call your field environmental officer, call your regional environmental officer. They'll contact the rail operator for you. They'll contact me. I'll contact Homeland Security. I've done it before. Somehow we can work with it. Now, now I will tell you that the more difficult these things are, the more time they add. And we've got some, some means of trying to deduce this information from other sources, too. So even if the rail operator is hesitant, we might be able to find some other ways to get the same information. Uh, quick story, I was talking to the to, uh, Department of Homeland Security about a particular rail yard in New Jersey once. And it was difficult to get information about this thing. And they got a call about a suspicious character that was hanging up by the side of the tracks and counting cars. He's sitting there literally in a folding chair with a pad of paper, and he was writing down all the train information. Now, guess what? That's the same information that you need. So tell that rail operator, you could get the same information by sitting next to the tracks for a week and writing it down. That's the level of data you need. But anyway, they got this call about a suspicious character with a pad of paper who's writing down train activity, and they sent a, you know, one of those black SUVs you've seen to go talk to this nice man. Come to find out that he was a citizen of the United Kingdom who was a train hobby enthusiast. And one of the latest trends in rail, model railroading is to replicate rail yards and get all your buddies together to operate the freight cars just like the big boys do. And they were gathering data about how the rail yard operated so that they could go back to London and do the same thing in the basement and accurately replicate the activity in that rail yard. So it was a harmless use. The black SUV shook his hand and went away. But the, the point is, that this information is available. It, we can make phone calls to help them understand our needs, and we can work with you to get the information you need. Next question. What are the minimum distances for airports, railroads, and rail yards, military installations, facilities to the project? The, the first level of a noise assessment is to find out whether you've got a problem. Great question. Um, I refer to these as the threshold criteria. If there's a major road within 1,000 feet of your site, you need to do a roadway assessment. If there's a railroad within 3,000 feet of your site, you need to do the railway, railroad assessment. If there's an airport within 15 miles of your site, you need to know about it and find out what their noise map says about how they generate noise. In, military installation is a little more difficult. Again, it, it lead, generally leads more to the loud impulse sound end of the spectrum rather than the noise generation end of the spectrum. In either case, they have information about how far their noise goes beyond their installation. 
I did a project that was a subdivision done outside of Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. And Aberdeen is unique in that they do uh, munitions testing, they do training, and they have a small airfield. So they had all the noise generators that we're concerned about. And again, we, we looked at where they were um, and called their noise office, and their noise office shared with us what the link for the online uh, plan that included the noise maps for not only the, the noise generated by the airfield, but also the blast noise generated by the training activities and the testing. So the information was readily available. We were able to just download the maps. Literally, within about an hour, I had an answer to the question. Thanks for asking that one, by the way. It's something that comes up often. Next question. If I have 10 years of annual traffic counts for a stretch of roadway and four-year-old noise assessment for that stretch of road, could that old assessment data be used as a quantified source for noise data, assuming no substantial changes in traffic counts? Short answer is yes. Uh, how I would I would try to validate that. However, call up the local planner, explain the situation, where your site is, what data you've got. A lot of folks, a lot of jurisdictions will say, "Our, you know, we don't have up-to-date traffic projections for that roadway, but the area is generally growing by two percent a year. So just extrapolate." That, uh, that data by 2% and then whatever the 10% requirement is for HUD, and that should be fine. And when you document that phone conversation with the data that you got and the calculation for how you got the 10 years out, we're fine with it. We're looking for best available data, and we encourage you to, to use existing sources. Next question. Is there some combination of roadway traffic count and or roadway number of lanes that might be used as a guideline in defining a major roadway? If I had 10 years of annual traffic counts for roadway. Um, what I usually tell people in, in technical assistance phone calls is that we don't define major roadway because we don't know what it is. The, my favorite example is a, one, you know, a little two-lane road that gets virtually no traffic except for the half dozen, car, the half dozen houses that are along it. But at the end of that road, there's an asphalt plant. All right? So the traffic counts on this road are going to be very low. But asphalt plants generally feed roadway work. Roadway work is generally done at night. Nighttime traffic by trucks is significant. Like I said earlier, the, the day-night noise level is penalizes nighttime noise. So whatever noise is generated by those noisiest of vehicles is exacerbated by the time in which they're doing that activity. So that what would typically be called a minor road suddenly has a major noise effect. I can't tell you that from D.C., but the locals can. You know your site. You know your jurisdiction. The local planners can help you with the activity in the vicinity. Think about it. Talk about it. Think about what's happening. Make the best project that you can. Next question. New construction not within 3,000 feet of travel tracks, but within – wait, let me go through that again. Hang on. New construction – not within 3,000 feet of travel tracks, but within 3,000 feet of a railroad maintenance shop with multiple tracks leading to maintenance bays. OK. That sounds a little bit like, I'm going to do some interpretation here, but that sounds a little bit like the Council Bluffs example, where the travel tracks were far away from the site, and the maintenance track, if you will, was the immediately adjacent one that was just used for the yard mule. So the short answer is we want you to assess all the rail tracks and the activity on each of those tracks. You may find that regardless of their location, the activity is such that it doesn't create a noise problem for you. But keep in mind, 
we are a federal agency, and you're using federal money and public money in general. So you need to have a good response when somebody comes up to you and says, what do you mean you funded something next to a rail yard? Don't you know they're noisy? There are rules about that. You need a good answer. Having the data for the activity on that track shuts down that controversy immediately. It's the best response you have. Please use it. We also need to know what that activity is so that we understand that it's a good project and that it's not going to be affected by that activity. So it's good for all of us to do the due diligence, to do the assessment, and to get the answers. Next question. What is the threshold for considering an airport and a noise analysis? 15 miles is uh, where I think you need to do your investigation. Sometimes um, tangential to that. Um, I talk to a lot of folks in different agencies about noise. There's a, a working group that meets regularly called the Federal Interagency Committee on Aircraft Noise. And those folks tell me that there is a movement afoot to create supersonic overland aircraft. Some of you are now envisioning a Concorde. Well, the problem with Concorde was it was extremely noisy, and because of that, it was only allowed to travel over water, and that killed its, its uh, transcontinental business. But now the technology is such that the supersonic booms that are, were the problem with Concorde are being minimized to the point where they're now, the, uh, the term in the industry is supersonic puff. They're a lot less noticeable. They still happen, but they're a lot less noticeable, and it's kind of uh, uh, amusing at this stage that that they you know that they've got these cute little terms for it. But the the reality of supersonic travel is becoming closer and closer to a reality, and because of that, the 15 miles I think is going to be important. We need to know what's happening in the vicinity. If somebody does permit supersonic overland travel, then the 15 miles is is probably going to be a minimum. Great question, though, thanks. What is considered a major road? We just went over that. I have trouble reaching the railroad operators. Any suggestions? I think I went through that pretty pretty thoroughly. Uh, if you have any questions, again, there are difficulties, go to your field environmental staff. Those folks are terrific. When I have a question about a local, you know, somebody comes to me directly and I have a problem, I go to them. They're a great resource for not only noise, but all the other environmental compliance questions that you're going to have. Please use them. They're great people. Uh, when projected, next question, when projected current noise data 10 years ahead, what percentage do you increase each year? Uh, it varies by jurisdiction. There are very few jurisdictions that will tell you that they're decreasing, but 1% uh, uh, to 3% is probably the range of growth that most jurisdictions use. Um, talk to local planners, they can help you. Abandoned railroad tracks, should I calculate them or not? Yes, you should. Just because they're not used now doesn't mean they won't be used in the future. As, uh, as we get more involved in urbanization, as fuel prices rise, as emissions concerns uh, increase, uh, my personal opinion is that we're going to be relying on rail transit more. That easiest way to do that is to reinvigorate existing right-of-ways by new tracks to new destinations and to build new uses along old tracks. So just because it's abandoned today doesn't mean it's not going to be used. And uh, don't forget about high-speed rail. They're looking for corridors to put fast trains through, and I understand those trains are very, very noisy. Uh, one of the differences is though the major noise doesn't come from the locomotive. It comes from the wind going over the cars. So it's a different way of thinking about it, but it's still a lot of noise coming through your community. Uh, some communities are going to be very concerned about that relatively soon. Another question. You may touch on this, but is there a, remain, a reminder to users to enter traffic data projected 10 years into the future uh, and a reminder about the 6.5 distance measurement? I'm not sure what the 6.5 distance measurement means. I believe there is a tool tip in the input box about using 10-year data. It's certainly mentioned many times in the noise guidebook, and this is probably a good time to uh, assure you that the online 
DNL calculator is completely compatible with the paper manual version that we've been using for many, many years. We've gotten the nearly the exact same answers from both, and the differences usually are because the online calculator is more precise and allows us to avoid the errors of, uh, of uh, dull pencils. So we're getting pretty good responses out of both of those things, and you can use either one. We don't care how you, how you submit your data. We just want you to do the, do the investigation. Good time for one more question. Uh, when determining a noise level of a road, what do, you, what do you do if you are only able to determine the total vehicle count? What about the truck portion of the calculation? Um, okay. I wasn't going to tell you this little fact to it. I was going to let the field environmental staff do it. But uh, we've got some distributions of vehicle traffic based on the type and location of roadway. So urban arterials might have one distribution breakdown, and rural collectors might have another distribution of vehicle traffic. Uh, it's a last resort. It's a very rough estimate. But we've got something you can use if there's really nothing available. Your first, your first line of attack is call the planners in the neighborhood, find out what's going on in that particular road. They've probably got traffic counts. They've got experience with that. They know what's happening not only now but in the future. And um, if that should leave you less than satisfied, call the environmental staff and they can help with some, uh, some estimates and distributions that you might find useful. That was it for us today. I want to thank you for joining us. The online evaluation was sent out automatically. Um, as we said earlier, the uh, presentations, this, the assessment tools for environmental compliance session that we did yesterday, as well as uh, Mr. Rivera's uh, acceptable separation distance that's going to be done on Monday, and Nancy Boone's tribal directory assessment tool presentation that's early November. I don't remember the exact date on that, but you'll be getting announcements on both of those. Have gotten an announcement on Nelson's, actually. And Nancy's will be coming out soon. So thank you very much. Look for those. Share those with your office grantees and other folks. And I uh, appreciate you joining us today and participating. Thank you. The webinar is now ending. Thank you.